as you exit. So with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. Title of our study today, Jesus and Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, Jesus and Melchizedek. Chapters 7 through 10 build on a theme and add to that theme that Jesus is greater, that Jesus is better, that Jesus is superior. And we've touched on some of the things he's better than, the the prophets, the angels, Moses and Joseph. and, And today, well, Abraham, the father of the nation, and Aaron, its first high priest. But let me just say, in case you're new to all this, Jesus is greater than anything and everything and anyone and everyone because he is the creator of all things. And I've observed you can't make something greater than yourself. When you make something, you make it lesser than yourself. And even Jesus had to do that. He didn't create little gods. He created people that could know, walk with, learn from, fellowship with the true and living God. Well, In any case, we're looking today at a chapter that, well, some of it will make total sense to you. Some of it, well, especially if you're not familiar with the Old Testament and the stories that that are, uh, we'll kind of review a couple of them. It it can be a little bit daunting. So, So here's what I encourage. Whatever you understand, hang on to it because God gave you that. And if we get to the end and you didn't understand anything, just come up and I'm happy to talk with you for a while. Any, I would be happy to clear up anything that I can clear up. But if you leave here only learning this, Jesus is greater than everything because he made all things. He's greater than everyone because they are a part of his creation. No one comes close. No one compares. And in a world where, well, people worship anything and everything but the true and living God, That's important to us. Now, he's writing to the author of Hebrews and dealing with a group of believers in Jesus who had grown up in in the, um, the, the fellowship of the Hebrew saints. They were Jews. They call them Jews today. That just comes from Judah. But originally, they're all called Hebrews. And and so that's who he's writing to. Hebrew believers in Jesus who are going through some real trials and some real troubles. He'll have some powerful things to say when we get to chapter 11 about the heroes of their faith that should build faith in anyone because that's a story of all these different people and the radical things God did for them and in them and through them. But here he's talking about a very mysterious guy. He is a priest. He's a high priest. And his name is Melchizedek. He's been called mysterious Melchizedek because, well, there are very few mentions of him in Scripture. In fact, two times in the Old Testament, eight times in the New Testament, Um, in Hebrews five times, uh, just in chapter seven. So so we're going to see a lot of Melchizedek and talk about him today and who he was and how he ministered and why he's so important. But know this, Aaron, who he will be contrasted with, is mentioned hundreds of times in scripture. And yet this guy, many people never heard of, is far greater, and we're going to see why. Chapter 7, verse 1 begins, for. And that word for is very much like the word therefore. It says that the stuff that just preceded would be helpful, but we don't have time to look at it. So later, look back at the last few verses or the last entire chapter. But he's saying this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all being first translated. And and this is what Melchizedek means and who he is, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Salem, of course, they get the word shalom, from a form of it, also Jerusalem, 
And that's, of course, uh, why it's so important. Verse 3 says, and this is where it gets a little strange, he's without father, he's without mother, he's without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Well, there's a lot there, so let's unpack some of it. When he says he is the king of righteousness and the king of peace, some have said, well, that has to be Jesus then. This is a pre-incarnate, uh, you know, appearance of Jesus. But it's not Jesus because this guy is a king of Salem that, or a king of Jerusalem, king of peace. But we're going to find out that that. Jesus so far surpasses him. He is just someone like Jesus. And he happens to have a priesthood that Jesus is associated with. And what, what this author is setting out to do, and hopefully I, I won't um, blur it, I'll make it as clear or clearer than he's trying to, is to show that Melchizedek and his priesthood is greater than Aaron and his priesthood. Most of you, unless you're brand new to this and haven't read through the Old Testament, most of you know Aaron was Israel's first high priest. He wasn't a perfect priest. In fact, he's the one who made the golden calf. And the most amazing thing to me about Aaron is that God kept him. Because if Moses is on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, Aaron's down in the valley fashioning and forming a golden calf. And when Moses comes down and is just flabbergasted, he can't believe it. How could his big brother, because that's who Aaron is, how could his big brother Aaron do such a thing? He's getting the Ten Commandments up there that says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Have no other gods before me. And he lays out the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down there. Only guy who ever broke all the commandments at once. He was so upset, he broke the commandments and had to get another set. But... But here's the thing, Aaron, they bring gold to him and he fashions and forms this thing. And when, and when Moses says, what in the world did you do? What, what were you thinking? He goes, listen, I don't know what happened. We, we threw, threw some gold in here and this thing just popped out. And I'm thinking of all the, you know, like dog ate my homework or every, anything stupid you could ever think of. Nothing could be stupider if stupider is even a word. But, but to say that this just happened. No, nothing just happens. He didn't confess what he'd done. And yet God in his grace and, and amazing mercy, he doesn't fire the guy. He just keeps working on him. And I like that because we're a work in progress. Scripture says, he who began the good work will be faithful to complete it. And here's why it's so important that that who is Jesus for you. Because if you're in a process of transformation that you're responsible for, man, I feel sorry for you. Because at your best, you're never going to become what God intends you to be. You probably won't even make what you're hoping to be. But if Jesus begins a work, he always finishes the work he completes. He completes it every time. Well, anyway... Let's, let's break a little bit of this down and, and clear up any possible confusion. When it says he has no beginning of days, nor end of life, he isn't saying that he was an eternal creation or cre that he existed eternally like, like the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's saying there's no record of his birth or death. Well, well. I guess I should back up a little bit. It says that, that he's the king of peace without father, without mother, without genealogy. That means, and that's uh, verse three, there's no oral or written record of his ancestry. That's important because every Israelite knew, and we're studying through the book of Numbers right now. If you've never heard of it, it's the third a fourth book in the, uh, in the Pentateuch there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But they're wandering in the wilderness, and a lot of the things that, that we know are important, we learn there. And one of them is that every Israelite knew his ancestry. Everyone knew who their dad was. Everyone knew who their, their tribe was. And, and that was important because that had to do with how, where they camped when they traveled, what they were responsible to do. 
And so everybody, even Jesus has this genealogy and everyone in that day had memorized the genealogy from the people from which they came. But we have no record of Melchizedek. That doesn't mean he didn't have uh, parents. It just means no one knows who his parents were. Uh, no beginning of days or end of life. That just means there's no record of his birth or record of his death. But made like the Son of God, he remains a priest continually, just like our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Holy High Priest, Jesus. He's called the King of Salem. That is an abbreviated form, as I mentioned, of Jerusalem. It's called the King's Valley. Historian Josephus makes mention of it, and it also appears in Scripture related to Melchizedek. He is a priest of the Most High God, and he's before Aaron by hundreds of years. He's before the Levites by the same hundreds. Uh, he ministers to God and, and with prayers and sacrifices. That's the ministry of a priest. Mel is totally unique. He appears out of nowhere. As I mentioned, he's only mentioned um, 10 times in the entire Bible. Now, Genesis 14 has a story that's so important to, to kind of put all this together. And I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I will read a little bit of it. It actually starts with a guy named Lot, and most of you are aware of him. He uh, was Abraham's nephew. They were traveling together, and the flocks that God had blessed them with grew to be so great that they needed to separate. Abraham, knowing all the land before him was his, said, hey, Lot, take whatever you want. And Lot looked toward the fertile plains of Sodom, and uh, it looked good to him. And then he moved toward Sodom, and he no doubt prospered there. And then he moved into Sodom. And at this point, I just want to say, you really want to check out the leadership if you're moving to a new location, to a new city or a new region. Well, if you're moving to America, good luck. Because, you know, the on the national level, we're a mess. But, but the, the point is, Lot didn't know much about Sodom, but Sodom was really bad for Lot and his family. So we find him moving into Sodom, later moving up in Sodom. He's somebody there. He sits in the gate. That's where the elders would be making decisions about various things. People would bring their problems to him and such. So here's what happens. He ends up in Sodom with his daughters and his wife. And uh, most of you are aware that Sodom got destroyed and Lot had to be rescued. He literally had to be dragged out of there before the destruction of Sodom with fire and brimstone. But th that whole story begins in Genesis 14 with kind of a, a uh, a surprising uh, statement that there was a war in the Middle East. Can you imagine that? Um, four kings against five um, local kings, and that's the area where Lot was living. Now, just three of those kings, and I'll just give you their, their names so you get a feel for where he was and why this was a mess. Uh, the first is Bera. Uh, he's, his name means son of evil. And uh, I just want to say he was the king of Sodom, son of evil. And uh, it's a weird thing, I think, to name your kid son of evil, unless you're evil Knievel, then it makes sense. But for anybody else, um, like, so you got son of evil ruling in Sodom. You have Bursa, his name means with iniquity. So, and then you have Bella, which means destruction. So again, a tip for dads, moms, Listen, before you move your family to a new region, to a new city, to a new county, kind of check out what's happening there. And, and especially if the rulers are called the evil ones or, you know, they shouldn't sound like a biker gang. They, they should sound more like, you know, something that would make sense for leadership. Well, all of that to say these kings are attacked. They're taken captive. Lot's taken captive with them. And uh, Abraham, 
hearing about this, arms 318 of his trained servants. They pursue, engage, return with all the people and all their goods. This is important, I think, because understanding that Abraham even had 318 servants, well, he had way more than that. If he could arm these, these are military aged. You can trust them to take on the enemy. And they go and they bring everyone and everything back. Why are we even sharing or why am I sharing that? Because in Genesis 14, 17, if you're a note taker, jot it and check it out later. The king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley, after his return of the defeat uh, of the kings that he took out. And verse 18 of Genesis 14 says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. I like that. Bread and wine, that sounds familiar. It's like a communion service so long before Jesus actually instituted the Last Supper in those two things. But uh, he blessed him, verse 19 of Genesis 14, and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him tithe of all. Who gave who a tithe? Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe. And, and this is important because I'm sharing all that background because we're going to read some stuff here. And at least you'll be like, hey, I think that makes sense. Or at least I understand it. Because some things go on in this chapter that without background, they just would be, you'd, we'd be lost. So in any, in any case, verse 18, we saw that Mel brings out the bread and the wine. He blessed him as we read both here in Hebrews and there, and uh, saying um, he, he blessed him in tithing to him. And, uh, and, then, and then he's blessed back by um, Melchizedek. And he's going to make the case that the one who blesses the other is the greater in a minute. So in case I forget to say it, because there's some stuff in between. Uh, when he tries to reward... Abraham, Abe had this to say. And this, was, this was the kings and those who were there and Abe brings everyone back and everyone's stuff back. He says, I've lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. And I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours lest you say I made Abram rich. He said, listen, I'm... I don't need anything for what I did. He was doing it for a lot in the first place, but everyone was rescued by him. Everyone was brought back. All their goods were returned. And so he just wanted to bless him. And he's saying, hey, God's blessing me. I don't need you going around saying you're the one who did it. And in Genesis 15, 1, Abraham's maybe having some second thoughts because God tells him, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. I like that. Yeah, I think he might have realized, you know, we took on those kings, but we didn't kill everybody. I mean, they could come back and get on us and be after us. And, and the reason I think that is because God never warns anyone unnecessarily. If he says, don't be afraid, it's because he knows Abram is afraid. So um, we read it earlier, king of righteousness, Righteousness for you or for me, it only exists within us because it's been imputed to us, imparted to those of us who believe as Abe did uh, in the Lord who blessed him. Um, King of Peace, that's kind of a great name because um, no one has more in common with our Lord than Melchizedek. He's the King of Peace. He's the king of righteousness, but Jesus isn't Melchizedek, and Melchizedek isn't uh, Jesus. Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he is reigning over all. So, so in any case, our lord, our creator, our savior, Melchizedek is a man. He's not God. He's not an angel. He's not Jesus. He's just a man we know very little about. 
And in a culture and in a time where everybody kind of knew what was going on. We read it in verse 3, and I'll read this just to, you know, get us down to the next section. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, again, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. And I like that. We're like the Son of God, too, but we're like Our likeness is what he's done in us and is doing in us. He remains a priest continually. So again, we don't know when he was born. We're not even sure he ever died, but that's not a problem because Enoch walked with God and God took him. Enoch never died. Elijah walked with God and, and, well, he was raptured up right in in the full view of of the one he was discipling, and that would be Elisha. And uh, and, and I like Elijah and Elijah for this reason. When, when the younger who's been mentored by the older uh, is asked by him, what do you want? I got to go. Lord's going to take me. What do you want? He goes, I want a double portion of what God gave you. And I like that a lot. If somebody who could give you anything said, what do you want? Man, your head, your head could take you so many places. But if your heart was like his, you'd say, I just want more of the Lord. I just want more of what you have, more of the spirit that was upon uh, uh, Elijah and, and more of the power that emanated from that relationship. Now, we don't know what happened to Melchizedek, but we do know this. He's greater than Aaron. He's greater than his sons of whom we know all these things. We know everything about them We know very little about him, but the thing that matters most is he's greater because Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? Well, he wouldn't be a priest at all if if, um, he didn't come from that earlier priesthood because the Levites uh, were, not all Levites were priests. All priests, though, were Levites. So you have... um, Aaron, the first high priest, he had a couple sons. One of them would have been the next high priest, but they were as bad as their dad, and God had to kill them. Then he had a couple other sons. One of them will become the high priest. But in that priesthood, everything is, is kind of laid out for them. But Jesus is not of the Aaronic priesthood, but yet he's a priest. And he's in the order of Melchizedek. And get this. Because that's a pretty profound thing. Jesus has to exceed Aaron and those guys that were priests that were temporary and that that were flawed. and, And we just know little about Melchizedek, but we know he was greater than any others uh, that followed after him. And Jesus is of that order. I started to mention, and I want to make sure I do, Some of you are aware of this. Some of you, it'll be new to you. When Jesus ministers in Jerusalem and it says he went into the temple, some some people imagine, some of you maybe, imagine, well, he's going into the actual temple. No, he was in the temple courts, the outer courts, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, places that Gentiles could go and that women could go. Only Levites could go into the actual tabernacle portion and only descendants of Aaron could go into the the temple proper and to its holy place and into the holy of holies. So that's a huge thing. Jesus didn't go into them because he wasn't a temporal priest. He is an eternal priest. He was always that. And what's the ministry of the priest? To, To minister to, well, the father. And Jesus did just that. When he was on earth, he was fully submitted to the Father. He said, no one takes my life from me. I have power to take it up, to lay it down and take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Jesus did always those things that pleased his Father. He was never less than the Father because he became a man. He was just submitted to the Father as the one who came to die for our sins. Well, verse four, he starts to wrap it up, not the study, just this section. And he says, consider how great this man was 
to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. He's saying Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, and that's a huge thing. Indeed, those who were of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. We see this in Genesis after Joseph has been sold into slavery. He's down in Egypt. This is long before the people are oppressed there because the nation didn't even grow yet. There was 70 of them at the time Jacob comes down. That's dad. He's the father of the 12 uh, that are the fathers of the 12 tribes. And, and when he finally makes it down to Egypt and he stands before Pharaoh, he blesses Pharaoh. And if you're like, well, what's the big deal? The big deal is the greater blesses the lesser. Pharaoh was lesser in Abraham's eyes and in the eyes of the sons because they're like, man, dad's blessing him, not him blessing dad. So beyond all contradiction, he says, the lesser, in that case, Pharaoh, and, uh, and is blessed by the better in, in that case, Again, that's Abraham, I mean, that's Jacob. And then our story, the lesser here is going to be, um, or the greater here is going to be Melchizedek and the lesser, the one offering to him. Well, here mortal men receive tithes, verse eight. But when there, when he received them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives, even Levi who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. I didn't do the math on how long it was before you get from, you know, Abe to, to Levi, but it's a while. And, and what I want to say is that this is just one of those things where if with no background, you're just like, this, what difference does it make? Maybe that's an okay question. It, it makes a difference because all of this is proving to a group of people that were starting to waffle and vacillate about if they should just stick with Jesus or rely entirely on Jesus, or should they fall back on their roots? And they have the law and they have the temple was still standing and, and that there was a lot for them in Judaism as Hebrews. And he just wants them to know it's all about Jesus. And this idea that, that, well, he was still in the loins, Levi was still in the loins of his father of Abraham when he met, he met with Melchizedek. It's just telling us God isn't just seeing what is, he sees what will be. And when he sees a family, his intention is for the family. I believe wholeheartedly he doesn't save an individual just for his own sake or her own sake but for their family's sake. And, and I do believe we're getting close to the end. And, and I know some of you are thinking the end of the study, right? And I'm no, we're getting close to the end of times, the time when we know we're going to be with the Lord and his wrath is going to be poured out on this planet. So I don't think that, that I'm going to have great, 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 great grandchildren. I'm just hoping even to have some great-grandchildren, because I already got grandchildren. But the, the point is, time is short. Jesus said, we don't know the day or hour, but the times and seasons, he says, you got that. Wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places, all those increasing in frequency and intensity. Man, if that's not what's going on, I don't know what is going on. So all that to say, when all this was going down way back in Genesis, God was God was looking at the whole picture. He, was, he could see what we read in Revelation and in Matthew 24 about the end times. He knew all that was going to go down and everything that would happen in between. Well, anyway, all of that is a complicated way to say that Mel's greater than Levi and his priesthood is greater than Levi. So next he builds on that reality as it relates to the limitations of the priesthood 
the, the Levitical priesthood and the law that was God's gift to Israel, separating them from every other nation. Therefore, he says, verse 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? That word perfection is important. We began our last study with it. It literally means completion. Not perfect in the sense that, that you know, absolute perfection, but absolute completion. And so he, he's saying that, that if the Levitical priesthood was complete, if it could do everything we needed it to do, well, then it would still exist. It would still be the, the, the thing. But the bottom line is we've discovered that the sacrifices offered daily for sins, they could never save, they could never change or transform a person. They just testified every day that God's people were sinners just like the rest of the world and that they were in need of, of sacrifice in order to have a relationship with God. And so the, the law, he'll touch on it in a minute and he'll, He's going to build on all these themes as we press on. So I'll just touch on them because that's all he does. In the next chapters, he starts to focus more on each of these individual issues. So um, he says the priesthood being changed, verse 12, of necessity, there is also a change in the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And yet, Jesus' priesthood is greater than theirs. He's greater He's a perfect priest because he does what no other priest could ever do. Their sacrifice has covered sin. His sacrifice cleansed us of sin, gave us the, the ability to be born again and, and adopted into the family of God. Verse 15 says, Yet it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus died for our sins, but he rose again. So when it's talking about him having an endless life, it's because he's still alive. A priest forever, he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession. And the two primary ministries of a priest was to God himself and then for the people. And Jesus says, I did always those things. I do always those things that please the Father. He was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. So he sacrificed himself for us and now he's still ministering on our behalf because he's at the right hand of the father interceding for each of us for on the other hand verse 18 there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness those words make it seem like the law wasn't as great as it really was the law was far from useless it's revealed God's, in it is revealed God's righteous standards. And to be in Israel and of Israel and to say, we have God's holy law. We know what God wants. We know what he's done. We know all these things. Those first five books of the Old Testament, every believer needs to read them and be familiar with them because they lay out the whole, how we got here and why we're in the mess we're in and what God does about it. There's so, so, so much there. Well, in any case, the law was useful and still is. We're not under the law, but that doesn't mean we're ever to be lawless. I like the Ten Commandments personally, because when it gets to our relationship to God, Jesus, and he's the one who does this, our relationship to the Father, he summarized the Ten Commandments by boiling them down to two. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And here's why that works. 
if you love God, you're not going to have other gods. You're not going to worship idols. You're not going to disobey his word and dishonor his name. You're going to keep his name holy. If you love people, and the second table of the law is all about that, First commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I like that. He's just saying, treat your neighbor the way you treat yourself. Make sure you have everything you need. Make sure they're okay too. And you know, Jesus raised the bar even on that one because he said, I want you to love one another the way I've loved you. That's more than your neighbor. That's, that's your Lord, your Savior, your Creator, loving you all the way to the cross. Well, the law couldn't save, and it did condemn. It reveals sin. It reveals imperfection. It reveals our need for a Savior. So he says in verse 19, it made nothing perfect, but it did show the need for something more. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch he was not made priest without an oath, for they have, have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You can look back at the last study or recall if you were paying good, close attention, he made a big thing of this, that, that God made an oath and he could swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. And it's the same picture. Verse 22 says, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. That word surety means a guarantor. The one who, who says, whatever I've said is going to happen, you can be absolutely certain it will happen. Also, verse 23, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The, Lev the Levitical priests were born, they lived, they served, they died, and another would take their place. Same thing was true of Aaron, the high priest. And, and I was thinking about it, that the, the, I was thinking Aaron might, might have been the worst high priest ever, but he actually wasn't. That there, there were others that were equally or, or beyond him messed up. But I think the high priest that rejected Jesus and, and sent him to Pilate and, and, and condemned him, though he knew he had to be innocent, there was no way to prove the things they were saying about Jesus. Even when they got witnesses, they couldn't get two witnesses to agree. Then they had to hire people. And yet, if you have to hire someone to lie in court, and that's what this was, you know those are not good people, but they still had trouble keeping their story straight. Why? Because, well, somebody told me a long, long time ago, and I like this, I'll pass it on. If you want life to go easy, just always tell the truth. Why? You'll always remember the truth. You won't have to figure out, oh, wait a minute, what did I say last time? Or did I say the same thing to this one and that one? If you lie... You're going to get caught in it. If you tell the truth, well, then you're going to do much better. But in any case, they paid these liars. And, and to know that the high priest was a part of this whole thing, that, that he was a part of condemning Jesus. I know it all was within the, the plan of God, but those people were responsible for what they did. They don't get a pass because... Jesus came to die for our sins. They're like, well, we helped facilitate it. No, they sold him out. They, they, they paid people to lie about him. Well, again, because he continues forever, verse 24, he has an unchangeable priesthood. I like that. It's a reminder. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And we should be so grateful for that because he's all good. He's always good. When we're bad, he's good. When we're 
We sin, he's still sinless. He still forgives when we confess our sin. He's still faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Therefore, verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's enduring, he's unchanging, he died to save, yet he lives to intercede. For such a high priest was fitting for us, and this is a good description of our Lord. He is holy. He's harmless. He's undefiled. He's separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. That word undefiled, it could be undefilable because you should recall from the gospels that Jesus did things no one else would ever do because if they did them, they'd be defiled by them. And he's not only holy, our holiness imparted to us, he is inherently holy. He's not only harmless, he chose instead of to repay, he prayed for the very people that nailed him to that cross and, and, and those who mocked him on the cross. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Undefilable, he could touch a dead person or touch a leper and he wasn't defiled, they were cleansed or raised from the dead, separate from sinners because he never sinned, but has become higher than the heavens. He is one of a kind. And that is not true of any other priest as all sin many grievously. Finally, who does not need daily as those priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself points us to the cross. He said they make sacrifices daily. As we get into the next chapters, he'll talk about their, their daily routine of sacrifice and then their, their festivals and their feast and all those things. He said all of that continued because it never did the job, not fully, not finally, but Jesus once and for all offered up himself. Their sacrifices testified of and covered sin. Jesus' sacrifice paid for our sins. When he said, it is finished, it's literally paid in full. For the Lord appoints, or excuse me, the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came from the law, came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Lord, we are so grateful that you would love such as us that you would choose such as us, that you chose to come and live among us so you know exactly what it feels like to be us, Lord, to, to suffer and to sorrow and, and, and to be rejected and, and all the things that happen to us. The only thing, Lord, you can't identify with is our sin because you were tempted in all ways yet without sin. Yet you chose to identify with us on the cross where you took the wrath due us. You took the punishment, the penalty for our sin upon yourself. So when, when you said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, you were making that forgiveness possible. We're so grateful for that, Lord. We're grateful that there's nothing we can add to the blood you shed to the life you gave, the death you died. It's not the cross plus our best efforts or our best works or our best intentions. It's just you, Lord. When we stand before you, it won't be, thanks, Lord, and, and by the way, all I did. No, you say those who boast of what they did and now standing before you in judgment, Lord, are going to hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, and you're going to say, I never knew you. Not like that. Not like that. Not at all. Lord, I pray that not one here will perish, but all would come to repentance. And if there'd be any or many in our midst today or logged on or listening in that have yet to say, Jesus, I get it. I'm a guilty sinner. And you're a gracious, merciful, loving God. You didn't just have a plan. You were the plan. You laid down your life. You died for our sins. You were buried. You were rose again. 
you've ascended back into heaven. And Lord, we know you're seated at the right hand of the Father, smiling now. Just that we're studying your word and talking about you. You're writing in your book of remembrances because we're glorifying and remembering you. Lord, I pray, we pray, we unite in prayer that not one here would perish, but all would come to repentance. And if you're new here or you've been around, you've been in church, listen, it doesn't matter if you've been in church all your life or this is the first time you've ever stepped in to a church. It doesn't matter how many times you've heard Jesus died for your sins, he was buried and rose again, there's forgiveness and life everlasting in him. It doesn't matter how many times, it matters what did you do about it? Or what are you going to do about it? It's so important to have the truth. Those without it are lost in the darkness and deception. But to have it and, and not act upon it, that makes no sense to me. So if you've never said, Jesus, forgive me my every sin. Come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. So when I stand before you, you'll say, well done and enter in. Not depart from me, I never knew you. And, and that's the two choices. It's not about a destination. It's about a transformation into somebody created by God and loved by God, but not in fellowship with God. If you've never given your life to him and you want to do that right now, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. This isn't really about me and you at all. This is about you and the Lord. But every person who ever came to Christ made a personal decision for him. They didn't just wander into his presence, they, they either chose to follow him or chose not to. And I'm telling you, the fact that you're here and hearing these things means he's drawing you in. He's chosen you. He wants you. He loves you. But you've got to respond to him, anyone at all, this hour, this moment, this service. Lord, I'm a grateful man to be able to stand before your people and read your word and declare your truth and to share your gospel, knowing that your word never returns void. It will always accomplish what you sent it forth to do. So I'm resting in that promise, Lord. And, and I know that you're at work in every heart here. I don't know what you're doing in them, but you do, Lord. So have your way in every person here, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hey, let's stand for one last song together, you guys. <laughs>